In northern Spain, the largest limestone rock massif in Atlantic Europe has been transformed into a protected area for the conservation of Cantabrian ecosystems and wildlife. It is the largest national park in the country and one of the largest in Europe. A world of high mountains, alpine meadows and leafy forests, which was also the stage for important episodes in Spanish history. The Picos de Europa harbor different ecosystems. Valleys and mountain foothills are covered in luxuriant deciduous forests which have suffered the destructive action of man throughout the centuries. At their origin, they must have formed an uninterrupted expanse clearing only on the high mountain peaks, but today they occupy only 21% of the projected area. Water is one of the park's main ecological factors. There is an abundant rainfall pattern and on the summits, thousands of cubic meters of water are deposited each year in the form of snow. The water enables the existence of the dense forest mass and the animal life finds food and shelter in the depths of the wood. The Picos de Europa National Park covers 64,660 hectares, which are divided among the provinces of León, Asturias and Cantabria. It was created on May 11, 1995, as an extension to the first national park to be set up in Spain, that of the Covadonga Mountain, which was established in 1918. Although the forest mass is a mere reflection of what must have existed before human settlement, the forests of the Picos de Europa contain almost all the plant species to be found along the Cantabrian coast. Beech is the park's most important tree species. The beech forests form a wooded belt at an altitude of between 700 and 1,500 meters, protecting the ground from erosion and generating a rich, moist layer beneath them, which is why they are called the wet nurses of the mountains. Plant species multiply in the beech forests. There are oaks, birches, servals of hunters, some yews, gall oaks, mostajos, and a tree known locally as chardon, or mother of the fauna, the holly tree. The holly tree bears fruit in winter when the deciduous forest has lost its leaves, which is why it becomes a fundamental food source for certain animal species. But if the winter is the time of shortage in the deciduous forest, autumn is the season of plenty. The trees bear fruit and the animals take advantage to accumulate fat which will enable them to face the cold season. In this delicate ecological chain, hunters and prey sustain a fragile balance. Without the fruits of the forest and its protective covering, the first lynx would not exist, so that it would be impossible for the rest of this biological community, so rich in plant and animal species, to develop.
As night falls, the national park fills with new sounds. In an area with so much moisture, amphibians find a perfect habitat in which to evolve, and although the majority remain invisible during the daylight hours, the nocturnal obscurity brings them out of their hiding places. Between the months of March and April, the common toads gather in the ponds and small lagoons to mate. They are terrestrial animals throughout the year, but when the mating season arrives, they approach the water, observing an astonishing loyalty to the same places year after year. Mating is auxiliary and can last from eight days to a fortnight. The females, who lay up to 7,000 eggs, lay them in the water, leaving a string of black eggs, which will hatch between two weeks and 18 days later. The mammals have colonized the park's different ecosystems from the summits to the fertile inner valleys. The changes brought about by man in some of these ecosystems have depleted or moved the most specialized species, while others, such as the fox, have been transformed into survival specialists. The fox is the carnivore best equipped to survive the changes due to its adaptability, well-developed psyche, and high reproduction rate. It has finely tuned sensors and is extraordinarily intelligent, which is why it settles in all the park's habitats, from the deciduous forests to the meadows of the subalpine stratum at an altitude of between 1,700 and 2,300 meters. The great majority of the large mammals live or depend on the deciduous forest. There are more food resources among its depths and the lush vegetation provides a shelter where they can hide from predators. The herbivores, such as this roe deer, rove frequently on the boundary between the forest and the meadows, enjoying the nourishing grasses of the latter, but without straying from the sheltering forest. Also making their way to the meadows are the chamois, or robethos, as the locals call them. Midway between a goat and an antelope, the chamois is the lord and master of the Cantabrian peaks. There are nine different subspecies in Europe, two of which live in northern Spain, one in the Cantabrian mountain range and the other in the Pyrenees. While the subspecies in the Alps or Carpathians reach weights of between 50 and even 60 kilos, the Spanish subspecies are smaller and generally don't exceed 35. While the majority of herbivores seek protection in the forest when they feel threatened, the chamois adapted to life on the summits flee to rocky places and take refuge on the escarpments where no predator can reach them. Thank you. 
The geological history of the Picos de Europa dates back to the Carboniferous period. Over 300 million years ago, the limestone that dominated the mountain range was gradually deposited on a marine platform until reaching a thickness of over a thousand meters. But it was approximately 30 or 35 million years ago that the orogenic forces became active again, and at the same time as causing the Pyrenees and the Alps to emerge, they raised what are now the Picos de Europa. Subsequently, the glaciation of the Quaternary and Karstic phenomena sculpted the park's orogeny, and it's to this action that we owe such symbolic places as lakes Enol and Erthina within the Covadonga mountain area. The last glaciation of the Quaternary took place 15,000 years ago at a time when prehistoric man had already settled in these territories. The history of man and the Picos de Europa has been very intense from the outset. From the time of the Celts who worshipped the god Vindius, these mountains have had a sacred character. Subsequently, their relation with the battle and victory of King Pelayo against the Muslims, the origin of the reconquest of Spain, finished by transforming them into a symbolic place revered by its inhabitants. Descendants of those first settlers of the Quaternary period have survived to this day and man continues to live inside the park. Pasturing is an activity which dates back centuries and which is still permitted within the protected area. Flocks of small sheep, herds of Pyrenean goats and Asturian mountain cows share the meadows, producing the milk that serves to make the region's exquisite artisan cheeses. Covadonga Mountain National Park was created, precursor to the present-day Picos de Europa Park, which encompasses it, locals were already grazing their flocks in the region, which is why they were allowed to continue with their domestic animals. Man's pressure on nature then began to intensify. Wild animals gradually started taking shelter in the protected areas, while their numbers began to decline in the forests that were free of restrictions. However, for the men living within these protected areas where hunting was forbidden, the sheltering of certain species within them didn't take long in developing into a problem. For farmers, the increase of herbivores within the reserves represented a continuous threat to their crops, while shepherds and livestock farmers looked on in concern as wild carnivores sought refuge in the areas where they grazed their herds. Among the latter were the shepherds of the Picos de Europa, because within the park, in the same areas where cows, sheep and domestic goats roam, lives the wolf, the most powerful predator of the Spanish forest. In primitive societies, when man was still a hunter and gatherer, the wolf was a totemic figure, that was admired and respected. But when agricultural and livestock societies began to develop, wolves became competitors that occasionally killed domestic animals, and their image changed from that powerful totemic figure into the personification of evil. With an ever-diminishing habitat due to human pressure and the increasing scarcity of its natural prey, the wolf occasionally resorts to domestic animals to feed itself. <laughs> to compensate their protection with the damage they cause to shepherds in the park, the authorities pay for the animals that the wolves kill. Although they are often attributed the deaths of sheep and goats, 
that have been caused by attacks of cimarrones, domestic dogs turned wild that hunt in packs and aren't afraid of man's presence. The black legend of this super predator has given rise to its indiscriminate hunting and persecution. Little over a century ago, wolves were spread throughout Europe. Today, only Italy, Portugal and Spain still count the wolf among their natural heritage. The wolf's eating habits make it dependent on large-sized prey, such as deer, roebuck and wild boar. In places where these animals abound, wolves rarely attack domestic herds because centuries of persecution and slaughter has taught them to fear man and distance themselves from human settlements. The wolf is a fundamental part in the balance of the ecosystem. Without the pressure of predators, herbivores multiply unchecked and end up by exhausting the plant cover that feeds them. By hunting them, wolves control their numbers and indirectly protect the natural environment by forcing their prey to move when fleeing from their attacks. In this way, vegetation recovers and herbivores do not exceed the number that can be supported by the ecosystem. The wolf also makes a natural selection process by eliminating the weakest or maimed animals so that it strengthens the herbivore populations on which it feeds. The cattle livestock that live within the park frequently serve as food for the large carnivores. However, animals that die naturally also represent an important part of the carrion eater's diet. When a sheep dies, a whole procession of ghouls file past the corpse. First come the magpies and ravens, having to hurry before the arrival of the more powerful birds. Then come the griffin vultures, and the Egyptian vultures don't take long to appear, alerted by the presence of the corvidae, which they see from the sky at heights of hundreds of meters. During the feast, the animals wait their turn depending on their degree of hunger. The bigger the appetite, the fiercer the aggression, so that the most needy end up being the first to eat. It's for this reason that the vulture's carrion feast is a continuous riot of constant aggression, which is little more than bloodless warnings of the hunger suffered by each fellow diner. When vultures succeed in finding a corpse, they eat as much as they can so that on occasions when they have finished, they weigh so much that they can't manage to take off and have to rest alongside the dead animal until they have digested. On these occasions, if they spot danger approaching, they regurgitate the undigested meat and so eliminating the excess baggage, resume their weight and take off in flight to safety.
Within the Bikurus de Europa mountains, those of Covadonga are the most symbolic, not only because it is the area of the first Spanish national park, but also because of their important role in Spain's history. According to legend, it was here that King Palayo conquered the Muslim invaders, initiating the Christian reconquest of the entire country. Chronicles relate how an old hermit who guarded an image of the Virgin Mary in a cave urged the king to invoke her protection in the battle. Pelayo conquered the Muslims and the place where the image stood became the center of worship for Christians and the Asturians in particular, who made the Virgin of Covadonga into their patron saint. In Covadonga today, a basilica commemorates the triumph of the Christian king, and just a short distance away, in a lime rock face, the legendary cave is preserved where the Santina is revered, the image of the virgin patron saint of Asturias. It is precisely from this cave, the Dominican cave or cave of Our Lady, that the name of Covadonga originates. Some chronicles recount that it was here that the old hermit showed Pelayo the image of the Virgin, while others maintain that it was the Asturian king who brought it here to help Pelayo in the battle. The inside not only contains important images of worship, it also serves as the eternal resting place of the famous King Pelayo, the one who gave Covadonga an unforgettable role in the history of Spain. In historical times, the forests of the Picos de Europa were populated with a large number of bears. The very son of Pelayo, Fabila, died while hunting them in these mountainous lands. Today, however, the bear is the rarest and most powerful animal in the park. The bears do not live year-round within the protected area of the Picos de Europa, but rather pay sporadic visits to the area of Amieva and Valdeón, coming from the neighboring Riaño mountains. The Cantabrian bear population is scarcely 20 in number in its eastern nucleus and 50 in its western one. Although it seems that the populations have stabilized, the two nuclei have less than 70 or 90 bears, which some specialists consider the minimum viable population. In other words, that the population has a 95% possibility of sustaining itself for 100 years without the direct intervention of man. For centuries, men have hunted and killed the bear, fearing for their herds or attracted by its trophy, until pushing it to the edge of extinction. It's a similar story to that of the wolf, but the bear is less adaptable and finds it much more difficult to recover its numbers. Today, the reserves of the Cantabrian mountains are the last hope for the Iberian bear, since the Pyrenean population seems condemned to disappear definitively. The authorities compensate livestock and crop farmers for damage caused by the bears. The government and private institutions are joining forces to save them. And little by little it seems that the bears are beginning to recover. Perhaps at some point in the future, they will become numerous again in the fertile beech forests of the Picos de Europa National Park. <laughs>